Christmas. We uh, began it last week, um, and if you haven't been with us, I encourage you to go back to get kind of caught up on some of the things that we've been studying throughout Amos. Uh, but as, as you are, Amos chapter 5 is where we'll be today, and uh, as you're making your way there, uh, I was thinking about those moments where you have to go shopping, and uh, I do not like to shop, but I do understand that since I've moved here, there is Stone's River Mall. I keep wanting to call it Stone Crest, uh, but Stone River's Mall, where you can go and do some shopping. You can go to the avenue and do some shopping there, and, and whenever I have to go shopping, especially maybe for like around Christmas time or whatever it may be, I'm... I'm thankful for a place like the Avenue or for the Stones River Mall to be able to go from shop to shop, to be able to get for this person, that person, and kind of just shop around from place to place to get those maybe five or seven items that I'm needing, and hopefully I can do that at, at one time. And the thing with that is, is that sometimes it would just be nice if you could kind of have just that one spot, that one stop shop where you could go. And so for me, a lot of times that's become like Sam's or Walmart or Amazon, whatever it may be, in order to be able to get kind of those things that you want without having to go here, there, and everywhere. And the reason why I bring that up is because if we're not careful, there's this thing that we have today that we call church shopping. And we have this mindset and this idea that, well, I would really appreciate and enjoy that church for what they offer, and this church offers that. And it's not an uncommon thing that when, especially you move into a new town or you're in a new community, that you're wanting to find a church that you want to be a part of. But oftentimes, the question that we aren't asking whenever we're going, even though we probably know it's the appropriate one, is, Lord, where would you have me fellowship? And where would you have me serve? And where would I be engaged at? Like, Lord, where do you want me to be a part but oftentimes what happens, if we're not careful, is we go in and we, we begin to sit back, and this is, this is understandable, but we sit back and we kind of evaluate, like, how is the preaching? Uh, a little too long, a little too short, a little too topical, a little too exegetical, and so on and so forth. They're like, ah, that's too many stories, that's not enough stories, um, that's dry, that's fluffy, and it's on and on it goes just with the teaching. Or it might have to do with, well, I wish the facility was a little bit bigger, I wish it was a better location, I wish it was closer to me, and on and on, and on it kind of goes. Or it might be, do they have a student's ministry, a children's ministry and how vibrant is it? Is there a men's ministry and a women's ministry? And, you know, we kind of observe these things or music. Music is a big deal. Do they have hymns? Is it more blended? Is it more contemporary? Is there going to be drums? Is there going to be a guitar? And I remember especially where I was pastoring in Oklahoma, like that was still those worship wars were a thing, like they were happening. And we began to, if we're not careful, we began to just miss, as we've been singing this morning, the, the heart or the, the purpose of why it is such a privilege for us together. And, and I get it. There's nothing wrong with having preferences. We all do. We all have things that we prefer, but it's that that willingness and that desire to be able to come into a, a fellowship of people. And it's been what's been such a joy for Tiffany and myself to be able to call Mission Point uh, our, our home and our church family is to be able with, sure, there's things that we want to see that would happen and, and growth and vitality and all these kinds of things, certainly. But this has just been such a refuge and a place of just joy of the relationships that we've been able to, uh, to make in the time that we have been here. I can remember visiting with a friend of mine who was on staff at a church. He was their missions pastor in Las Vegas. Yes, missions pastor, Las Vegas. It was awesome. Uh, and he was a past, uh, mission pastor of that church. And we began talking about this idea of, you know, how do you evaluate when you're a part of a church or maybe you're visiting to see, is, is this a church I want to be a part of? How do you evaluate uh, church health? How do you know that this place is a healthy place? This is a healthy group. Like there, there's vitality and health there. And one of the things that he brought up is he used the idea of a barometer. And he said, he said, I think there are different things, different barometers that we can use to kind of measure. And sometimes we get very kind of standoffish whenever we might bring in numbers because, well, numbers isn't everything. And what I found is a lot of churches or institutions that are like, we don't care about numbers, we care about people is because you are struggling with your numbers. Um, and then you have other people who are like, oh, we have all the numbers, but if we're not careful, you have all the bells and the whistles. And I've known of churches that, man, they are a well-oiled machine. They got everything you could possibly want uh, in the foyer, coffee bar, here's you know an espresso, and here's this, and here's that, and here's something for your kids, and here's something for your students, and here's something for this and that. But if the Holy Spirit were to walk out the back door, that church wouldn't miss a beat because they are just that well-oiled, efficient, man-made machine. And so I was visiting with my, my, my second closest friend uh, just this past week about this idea of if, if you're going to look and for mission point to look of like, we, we could get focused, and, and I hope that we are concerned or we look at the idea of church growth, 
But so often, a lot of churches over the last several decades have been like, how do we grow? How do we grow? How do we grow? And I want us to have kind of at the top of our banner, on our whiteboard, if you will, is church health. And hopefully, kind of diving off of that idea of church health is hopefully there is a line that says church growth. And not just church growth, yes, numerically, but church growth, are we, are we, are we healthy spiritually? Uh, are, are we growing in our relationship with the Lord? Are, are you more mature and further along in your walk with Christ than you were last July 10th? Like, is there growth? Is there health? Is there vitality? Or have you been stagnant over the last year? Have you plateaued? And so these are things that we want to look at, but I think oftentimes what we can do is these aren't unimportant things. Just as I've visited before many times, like with our team that works uh, on the stage and behind the scenes, hopefully our desire is that when we come into a setting like this is we want to do things, we want to sing, we want to play, we want to do sound and video with excellence because we want to let that be our sacrifice of praise to the Lord, but we also uh, don't want to miss the heart of what we're doing and why. Otherwise, if we're not careful, we can be much like we've been studying in the book of Amos. We can be like that northern kingdom of Israel that had so much tradition and history and ritual and heritage, and they're just going through the motions. And we're going to see today, God does not care for that. Last thing I'll mention before we just dive in is part of that idea of church health. And again, in this conversation I had with my friend this week, that idea of church health is what's maybe one of the best barometers to be able to see is church health happening. And by church, I mean the individual, but also the whole. And my hope that for us, whether we're using something like live, work, play and the ping pong balls, or we're doing small groups and we're trying to have those other points of the spear going out into our community and being intentionally mission focused and mission minded, is that what we see is life transformation. Because even this past week, if you were with us in MPA, we talked about the fact that you can't change your spouse, nor should you, because you can't change anybody. That is the work of the Holy Spirit, to transform and to change individuals. And so we want to welcome and say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And Holy Spirit, in my life as an individual, and in our life as a church, are we seeing life transformation take place? To where, yes, hopefully what that does mean is we are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and people are going and being transformed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light through salvation in Jesus. That is life transformation. But don't forget for you, you are still in the process of working out your salvation. It's called sanctification that he would continue and you would be able to see and experience and evaluate and go, he's still transforming me. Like he's still working on me. He's still moving in my life. I am different, matured, going forward in my faith because of the transformative work of God in my life. So my hope is that today, perhaps more than anything, this passage wakes us up and we go, man, we have the Holy Spirit in our life. It doesn't mean that because he's there that necessarily my circumstances will change, my diagnosis will change, my financial issues will change, but because of him, he can transform me from the inside out so that when I go through those trials, somehow I can echo the words of the Apostle James, I consider it all joy because he changes me. So let's look at the prophet Amos. And let's see what God has to say about the idea of transforming our lives and making sure that proper worship is at the heart of that. So Amos chapter 5, let's look at verses 18 through 20 to begin with. Uh, if, again, if you weren't with us last week, just a little bit of context. Uh, up to this point, essentially Amos, or God is saying through Amos to the northern kingdom of Israel, you've been found guilty and wanting. You, you are just literally just no justice. You're just beating down upon the oppressed and the poor. You're just going through the ritual and the routine. You're focused on wealth and health. It's just you're off. You don't care about me or the things of God, the word of God, the people of God. It's all just for show. And so they've been found guilty. And as a result, consequence comes because of sin. And he's like, consequence and judgment is on its way, but the beauty and the heartbeat of God is right there in the middle of this this prophet book, uh, Amos 5, is what we saw last week, seek me that you may live. Even though judgment can come, I would rather, <laughs> I, 
I would rather you repent and have life, have life everlasting with me, life abundant on this earth. And this is him now, verse 18. He says, alas, literally it's the word woe. You who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. As when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him or goes home, leans his hand against the wall and a snake bites him, will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? And you say, Pastor, that is the cheeriest verse you could have read for us here at the beginning of our time. Another way that I put this in point number one, if you're taking notes, you want to write into your margins, lions, bears, and snakes, oh my. And so what we find is that in this, he uses this word, Amos uses the word woe. Literally, it's a word used to denote the mourning cry of a funeral. It's as if the funeral of the northern kingdom of Israel is imminent, like it's, 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 it's coming. The day of the Lord is a, is a phrase, it's a concept, it's an idea that the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, all Israelites were longing for this moment, this eager anticipation of the coming Messiah. One, they believed his coming was to be soon, but two, they expected it to be glorious because they believed that with the coming of the Messiah, all of their enemies and all the nations that surrounded them, there would be this military conquest that would come with the coming of the Messiah. So they're eager for it. They're ready for it. But yet Amos is making clear in these three verses that the day of the Lord for the northern kingdom of Israel, it's not going to be glorious for you. It's going to be dark. You actually don't want this day to come in light of how you are currently living and conducting your life because you are so far from me that if I were to actually show up, it would not be good for you. It would be terrifying for you because of how you're living your life. You're that far from me. In fact, so much so, he's saying it's inescapable, the judgment that's on his way when the day of the Lord shows up. And he illustrates that with the, with the lion. He talks about a man who is trying to flee from a lion. Somehow he escapes from that lion, but then he runs smack dab into a bear. And that bear is like, Rah, and he's going to eat him. He's like, Ooh, I'm going to get away. And somehow he, he scampers away. That's a fun word, scamper. He scampers away onto his house. And he's like, I'm in my house. I'm in my refuge. I'm safe here. He puts his hand against the wall. And because it's inescapable, the judgment of God, snake bites him. The judgment of God is inescapable. And I know for Many of you have heard your stories of your faith in Christ. And here, here's the truth of the matter. You will not have to stand in front of the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, and have to wonder or be in fear of, am I going to have life everlasting? But every one of us will still give an account for how we've lived our life, even those in Christ. We are going to present to him, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, all of these things that we've done with our life, and it's going to be tested with fire to see if what we did had any internal investment or impact, or we were just kind of, I don't know, flitting our life away. I don't even know if that's a word. I made up another one. So here we go now into the, to the next section. And what we find is that the reason why they're uh, going to not be able to avoid this day of judgment, the heart of this is their hearts are far from the heart of the Lord. Their hearts are far from the heart of the Lord. Uh, look at verse 21. This gives just an example of this. I hate, I reject your festivals. This is strong language coming from God. Nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. Oh, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. If I could kind of encapsulate this idea of kind of our second point of what this is saying is that what they were experiencing was what I would call empty religion, just ritualistic religion. Empty religion is no replacement, here's that word again, for transformative, for a transformative relationship with Jesus. But oftentimes we go to the well of ritual and routine thinking this will appease God or this is what he wants. But instead it's no, 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 no. I want you, I want your heart, and I want you to experience that transformative, that life-changing and life-giving relationship with Jesus. Another way to put it in a much simpler way is just what Dr. Henry Blackaby said in Experiencing God. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. 
It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with the living God. And when you encounter the living God, my, oh my, I hope that you're different. I hope that when you have your time with him in the morning, or maybe for your schedule at lunchtime, or your schedule is when you get home from work or in the evening before you go to bed, that when you have that time with the Lord, is that you have, yes, the discipline to be in his presence, to be near him, to, to hear what he has to say, and then to talk to him through prayer. But that when you do so, again, you may get up off of your knees and say, man, my life feels a lot like it did before because my circumstance is the same. Diagnosis is the same. The financial issue is still the same. But man, he has come into my life and I have met the living God. And I'm different as a result because he changes things. He changes people. He changes minds. He changes hearts. Now we're going to see here that some of the things that he cannot stand. And I literally wrote this in my notes. So I had no idea if Phyllis was going to make these things. I put <laughs> items, items I cannot stand. At the top of the list was bananas. I kid you not. It's in, it's in my notes. So, so, items I cannot stand. Bananas, green beans, way up there. Horror movies, ugh, despicable. Snakes, don't like them. Um, but what we find is God uses this extreme language of where God, hear me, th this isn't something that we trifle with, that we play around with. God detests superficial worship. Insincere worship is an insult to God. When we just show up, not just here in a corporate setting, but in your day-to-day -day life, is your worship sincere or is it not? And only you can really evaluate that in your heart and your mind right now. And I'm not talking about a month ago, a year ago, when you were just on fire for the Lord and just meeting with Him. I'm talking about right now, July 10th. Where is your heart when it comes to God? And so he specifically says, uh, here are seven expressions of worship that God rejects. And what we want to be careful with is that this doesn't include us. And if we are drifting, that we would hear his voice and we would, if you will, drift back uh, to him. That what we wouldn't do is sing about the cross on Sunday with arms and voices lifted high. And then on Monday, deal in a double cross at work. Let's not sing about the cross and then deal in a double cross. So seven expressions of worship God rejects. The first one he says in verse 21 is festivals. When you think of a festival, think of a, a barbecue party. That's what these were. Th think of, remember the, the, this, the Passover that took place in the book of Exodus? Well, years later, there on out, God was like, remember what I did? Have a party. Like celebrate that I delivered you out of uh, bondage and slavery in Egypt. Have a festival. Have a party. Enjoy that. For us, we might say like when we went to the Nailers for July 4th or when we have like a potluck fellowship, those are kind of some of our festivals, if you will. And he's like, I hate them. <laughs> the next one is he says, your solemn assemblies. I, I don't delight in them. Think of a prayer meeting. You guys are coming together, he's saying, and you're having these solemn moments that are sacred and set apart, but I'm not a part of it. Like, like it, it, it's just for show. It's just for routine. It's just what we do. I've said it before, but I mean, if you want to clear a room, call a prayer meeting. Um, and my hope and my desire is that for us as a people, that a marker of, of our faith, and not that it has to be a visible thing, but I think it was D.L. Moody, the great evangelist who made the comment back in the 1800s, that if you want to see a man of God, see how tattered his Bible is and how worn out his knees are. Because he's in the Word and he's on his face before the Lord. But that we, we, we have, and this, and this isn't just by happenstance, the reason why we determined to have consecrated regular prayer the first Sunday of the month isn't because that's what we should do. We, we should pray because that's, that's what we do. No, we, we want to have it on the first Sunday of the month because in the same way on the first Sunday of the month, you may have noticed this, but normally whoever's giving the welcome on the first Sunday of the month highlights our, our, our giving and the importance and the priority that we would be a people that would be focused on giving our first fruits to the Lord because it's biblical. That we would be generous individuals and a church, generous in giving of our ability, time, and resources. And so first Sunday of the month, we're just like, we don't want to lose sight of that. So we want to continue to get that in front of us as a reminder. Same is true first Sunday of the month. We want to pray 
for our community and for our country and for our nation and for the kingdom of God to go forward, not because we, we think that's just what you do. It's because no movement of God and no healthy, vital, significant church who's on mission with the Lord accomplish anything without prayer first. And so I urge you, the first Sunday of August, man, fill up that conference room with me. Let's pray. Let's make it a priority that our solemn assemblies like that would be magnificent. If you're like me, I grew up in a Southern Baptist Church, pastor to Southern Baptist Church, still pastor in Southern Baptist Church. But I can remember growing up, every Wednesday night was prayer meeting. And I can remember going into a church and that prayer meeting was anything but a prayer meeting. It was a gossip meeting. It's not what we're doing on the first Sunday of the month. We're literally not even really sharing a lot about what prayer needs do we have. We just dive into the word and we dive into prayer in order that we would just pray. And then as you're praying, if something comes to your mind and you're praying for, let's say, Barb and what she's going through and Mike, someone around the table might go, I, I don't know when we're done praying. I don't really know what, what exactly. Give me an update on Mike and Barb. And then after we've prayed, because how often have we come into a prayer meeting and we spent 20 minutes sharing requests and two minutes praying because we got to go. <laughs> we got to get to the next thing. And we don't pray. Man, that we would be a people of prayer. The next three things that God just cannot stand, it's an interesting way to put that, um, is these offerings, burnt offerings, grain offerings, and peace offerings. And you say, well, what are those? Well, go back, watch the MPA on Leviticus. You can get an idea. But in our brief study of these different offerings in, in the study of the book of Leviticus when we went through the Pentateuch, is that these three offerings, some of you will remember, there were five that we shared in that session of the five, three of the offerings that were mentioned in the book of Leviticus, these sacrificial offerings, were voluntary. The other two were, it, were involuntary. It was like, you, you just need to do these. These three are the voluntary ones. And he's basically, what God is saying is, you're doing these things that are voluntary. The burnt offering was this offering that would say, I'm completely dedicated to God, and I'm willingly choosing to do this. And what God said in Leviticus essentially is, if you don't mean it, don't give it. <laughs> Same thing with grain offerings. It was voluntary. It was dedication of first fruits of the labor to God as a harvest gift. It was a thank you. The peace offering was a voluntary gift that represented this fellowship with God and with man. And yet the northern kingdom of Israel was like, yeah, we're at peace with God. And we're at peace with man. And we've read countless accounts of how they've been found guilty of just taking advantage of so many people and perverting justice in the courts and at the gates to where they're, they're offering these things. They look good. It looks right. It looks appropriate. This looks like church. But man, your heart is far from the things of God. He's like, just, just stop it. it. Stinks. The last two that he... The last two expressions of worship that God rejects is the noise of songs and the sound of harps. That doesn't mean that he doesn't like music. <laughs> I believe he gave us this gift. But he's basically saying is, man, you're just making noise and it's obnoxious to me. And so for us, it's like, yeah, we can get focused on the style, the choir, praise team, traditional, contemporary, orchestra, band, piano, guitar, all these different things. And it's like, man, if your heart's not engaged and submitted to the worship of God, then you're just making noise. Well, he goes on from there, and look at, look at verses 25 through 27 in your Bible. So he picks up from that point, and to kind of help emphasize it and kind of like reiterate what he's trying to say, is he says in verse 25, did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? You also carried along Sicketh your king, and Cayune your images, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will make you go into exile beyond Damascus, which does eventually, unfortunately, happen when the Syrian kingdom comes in. Says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. This again, as if God is saying, in case you're wondering who's saying this, here's my stamp. Yahweh is saying this, in case you were confused about who's talking. And this is what I'll say this, and this is what I think God is trying to communicate in verses 21 through 27 is this. Though important sacrifices were never the essence of God's relationship with his people. You hear me? Sacrifices, even in the Old Testament, were never the essence of God's relationship with his people. Rather, loyalty, allegiance, was expressed through obedience as the highest of priorities. And an example of this, we don't have time to dive into it, but an example of this is remember when King David drifted so far from God that 
Long story short, he committed adultery and murder. And finally, he's confronted with his sin by the prophet Nathan. And when David is broken and sees his sin, recognizes it, confesses it, cries out to God, what David comes to in Psalm 51 is he writes these wonderful words. He says, For you, Lord, do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. David says, sacrifices aren't bad, but what you want is my heart. What you want is my heart. Another way that you might be able to describe these verses in Amos chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, is that, did you bring me only sacrifices and offerings, but where is the obedience? Where is the allegiance? So much so that he begins to go back into the time of their wilderness, and he's basically saying, even then, back then, they were worshiping me, but today, today, it's like you're worshiping me, but you're also throwing in the Mesopotamian god of Sikath and the Mesopotamian god of Cayune that was associated with the planet Saturn, and he's saying, you're wanting to dabble and almost have like this insurance policy of, well... I want God, but wouldn't it be nice just in case that I would worship Baal and Moloch, and maybe they can help me with my crops. Maybe they could give me kind of what I really want. Sometimes what we have today is we have this comment that I'll visit with people, and you visit with them, of, I'm a spiritual person, very spiritual. And people will say, man, I really enjoy the the idea of grace and forgiveness within Christianity. It's a wonderful thing. I want some of that. They're shopping. I like the uh, tradition and the structure of Catholicism. I want some of that. They go to Mormonism and say, man, they got some great family values. Give me a little bit of that. And the idea of reincarnation, ooh, Hinduism, give me some of that. Enlightenment, that I could experience spiritual nirvana, give me some Buddhism, I like some of that. Or I'm my own God, I, I can make my own decisions and destiny and just an agnostic or an atheist, give me some of that. And they just continue to kind of bring in. And this is the thing that's terrifying. That even within the church, if we're not careful, we begin to dabble into some of these things. And we say, no, 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 no. I'm not the North, like the northern kingdom of Israel. I don't struggle with idolatry. And maybe you're not struggling with maybe leaning into Mormonism, into Islam, or into Hinduism, or Buddhism, or whatever it may be. But are you leaning into materialism or hedonism? Are we drifting? Because often what we can do is we can look at those things and say, what has my heart? Does God have my whole heart? Or is there something that is elevated beyond the throne of God and I've placed that thing, that person, and if you have, that's, that's idolatry. And God is just wanting his people because he loves them to wake up. I want your heart. So three questions, and then we'll be wrapping up. The three questions, and, and Kay, if you don't mind, can we put that first one up, if you don't mind? Just, we're going to come back to these, actually, at the very end, but where does the allegiance of your heart lie? Who has your heart? And the third one, does your heart beat in sync with God's heart? And the reason why I ask these three in this way is they're kind of a similar question, but I've, I've visited with my brother before. Sometimes when a question is asked to you with your personality and all your quirks, you're like, I don't really get what you're asking. So sometimes it's nice to maybe ask the same question in different ways. Um, so hopefully it kind of unlocks understanding of what, 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 are we, what are we talking about here? So where does the allegiance of your heart lie? Who has your heart? And does your heart beat in sync with God? And what this immediately made me think of is it rushed me into the New Testament into the book of Romans. We're going to have it on the screen. Can we show that Romans chapter 12? Some of you know this verse, but when we think about, well, what does it mean to worship for God to have my heart? This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Rome. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Let's go to verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. Here's that word that we started at the beginning but be transformed. See, you're still being transformed because you're in a transformative relationship with Jesus. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And when we come to God and we want to worship him, it's we're presenting ourselves. 
my, my last semester of seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, I took a class called worship, and I put it off until the very end because I heard it was incredibly boring. In fact, I kid you not, the professor's name was Dr. Borer. Um, I'm, I'm, de- I'm dead serious. It wasn't a nickname. And I was just like, I'll wait till the end and just kind of get through it. And I'm so glad that by the grace of God, I took that class my last semester before I went to go and pastor my first church because that class was transformative for me because it really made me examine what is worship. And we came to the end of that class, and we all had to write a paper on defining and explaining what is worship. And it wasn't because I wanted to be cutesy or really short, but my definition of worship is this. Worship is three words. Worship is life. That's it. Every aspect of your life as a follower of Jesus is to be worship. In fact, every person that has ever been born from the beginning of time until now, you are all designed innately to worship. Whether you're a believer or not, we all worship. We all give our allegiance, our gifts, our talents to something or someone because we are designed to worship by the Creator. The question is, who has your allegiance? Who has your heart? Who has your time? your pocketbook, your relationships, who's at the heart of it all. And so I'm about to quote to you, which is really weird, from my own paper (laughs) that I wrote uh, in 2007. I put far too often the church has relegated itself to just Sunday morning worship and maybe a handful of programs such as Sunday school, small groups, Wednesday night prayer meeting, men's groups, women's groups, etc., But the reality is true worship occurs every day of your life. We must have corporate worship because we don't want to forsake, as it says in Hebrews, the assembling of one another. There's something unique and special and powerful about corporate worship. But just as essential are the other six days of the week, that individual worship that you get to experience that those both, corporate and individual worship, not out of legalism, but out of discipline and devotion, would be the drumbeat of our life because we are worshipers of the God, the living God. The beauty of corporate worship is this, I wrote, is that we can't wait to get together with my brothers and sisters and what I was doing on my own Monday through Saturday, now I get to do it on Sunday with you. And I don't feel alone. I feel united. You're near physically. That's why it's so crucial. I know for a time we needed to do online things and we're still going to have an online presence, but that's why it's so crucial that as much as possible, not out of legalism or if I don't show up, people are going to say things, but I want to be with my family because I need you. I want to celebrate together what the Lord has done in my life and not try to use Sunday to get all caught up. Can I tell you when I first moved here, I'm going as fast as I can because I see it's 1052. When I first moved here in 2015, my life was bonkers. Me and Tiffany were just like, Everything was upside down. I mean, it was just crazy. And I remember just working, 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 just exhausted. And I remember we would go to church, uh, actually a church here in Murfreesboro, even though we were living in South Nashville. And then I would go into that church and I would be in that setting. It would take me, honestly, probably about 15 to 20 minutes to settle down my heart and my spirit enough to really pay attention to what was going on because it was just anxiety, fear, all that. And I can remember... By the time I would leave that worship service, I would feel a bit rejuvenated. And I would go, man, I can't wait to spend some time with the Lord tomorrow. Tomorrow I'd wake up, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Woke up, bam, get ready, drive to work, hour commute, ugh. And then you're just like, Monday's over, I'm so tired, I'm exhausted. And I was in the rat race of exhaustion and work. And by the time Wednesday afternoon came around, I was like, I don't even know what God said on Sunday. I feel so far from God. And there's all kinds of excuses and reasons why I could say that, but in the end, it is my responsibility to have the discipline and the want to and the wherewithal to say, as important as you are to pay my bills, God is greater still, and I need Him more than I need that. I need to be near Him. Because when I'm near him, I fall in sync with him, my heart beats with him, and he what? Transforms me, even in the midst of hardship and trial. If you don't believe me, I found a medical study. This is cool. 2017, 
Boulder University in Colorado, and we'll be done. There was this scientist who brought together 22 different couples, and what he wanted to do is he wanted to bring these couples together to see if they physiologically mirrored one another, if they were in sync with one another, like their, their breathing or their heart rate. Because this is what scientists have already discovered. He says, quote, scientists have long known that people subconsciously sync their footsteps together with the person that they're walking with. You ever notice that? I mean, I walk with Tiffany. I'm not that much taller than her. But I found, like, I could just take long strides or I just kind of walk with her. And we kind of fall in sync with one another. It's just kind of a natural thing that we do. He goes on from there. And he says, or we adjust our posture to mirror a friend's during conversation. Recent studies have also shown that when people watch an emotional movie or sing together, their heart rates and their respiratory rhythms, they synchronize. When leaders and followers have a good rapport, their actual brain waves fall into a similar pattern. And when romantic couples are simply in each other's presence, their cardio, respiratory, and brain wave patterns sync up. So this guy wanted to do something a little bit different. And what he did was he had this experience of when his daughter was born. And when his daughter was born, he was there with his wife in the delivery room, and he was like, she's in a lot of pain. How can I help? I can't, I can't do much, but how can I help? And he was like, I'll just touch her. <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm here. And so he would touch her, and he's like, I'd like to think that that helped her some. You know, maybe not a lot, but it, but it helped her some. So this, this individual, he gathered these 22 long-term couples that were about ages 23 to 32, and he put them through a series of tests. And the design was this. The men were the observers, but the women, they actually had to experience a mild form of pain. And in fact, it was just like a hot kind of compress that was like a little bit hot, not getting burned, burned, but like, you know, uh, pain. And what he was doing is he was measuring their heart and breathing rates. And what he found was before the pain was administered, these romantic couples who were just loved one, each other, loved one another, hearts, you know, connected to one another, when they sat together not even touching, their heartbeat and their breathing were in relative sync. When they sat together holding hands, their heartbeat and their breathing became more in sync. But even because they knew the other person, if they were even put in separate rooms, was there, their breathing and their heart rate was very, very, very similar. So what he did is he repeated those three different scenarios and then included the pain aspect. And this is what he said. The study showed that couples synced physiologically to some degree just by sitting together, but when she was subjected to pain and he couldn't touch her, the, synch the, the synchronization was severed. The pain severed the connection. But when he was allowed to hold her hand in the midst of her pain, their rates would fall back into sync and she didn't feel as much pain, even though it was the same amount. It's almost as it appears that pain and hardship and difficulty can be interrupted when someone is near. Friends, there's something wired within each of us to be near and to be in the presence of someone because it makes a difference. I've seen on, on, on a broad level, not on the spiritual level, but on a broad level, I've seen the decline in marriages when couples stop pursuing and dating each other. They're not near. They don't pray together. I've seen within churches go from healthy and vibrant to unhealthy and dying because they're going through the motions, country club mentality, because they're not being near one another and their hearts are not in sync through prayer and mission together. And the same is true in our relationship with the Lord. That when we choose, and it's our choice, when we choose to distance ourselves from him, it actually harms us, and it harms you. We're no longer in sync with him. We're missing his heartbeat, and when we miss his heartbeat, we get, we get way off. We're out of rhythm, and so it's not that we would be in a ritualistic or legalistic way, but in a health, life-giving way, we want to ask those same questions. Can you throw them back up, Okay. I want to ask those same questions before we go into a time of, of response. Is it matters if you're near to God and where your heart is? I want you to leave today being hopefully emboldened and encouraged and say, I want to spend time with Jesus this afternoon or tomorrow because it matters. Where does your allegiance of your heart lie? Who has your heart? Does your heart beat in sync with God's heart? And if you can say in all honesty right now, I don't feel that way, that's good because you're identifying truth and reality. The question is, what will you do with it? And here's the thing. You may feel like God is distant, but he is not because this is what Scripture says, and that's the authority, not our feelings. 
that if we would humble ourselves, James chapter 4, and draw near to God, he will draw near to us. Would you just close your eyes for just a moment? This week I was challenged in a conversation with a friend of mine that before we, before we sing, before we go through and do the next thing, is that this time is so crucial right now because the majority of you, once we start singing and we're quote unquote done, you're not going to probably think again about this moment until maybe a quiet moment later in the day or tomorrow at best. Right now is the time for you to do business with the Lord. So I'm going to give you like a minute. It's not even that long of just silence. And just allow yourself to ask and answer those questions. Where is my heart? Is it in sync with God? And what must I do to make that reality? How can I draw near to him? I think we would all agree we want Jesus in our life. We want our life to be healthy. But man, who has your heart? So I'm going to give you like a minute. And you ask and answer those questions and how you're going to respond that you might draw near to him tomorrow. Practically. So take just a minute. And then we're going to sing. Lord Jesus, may we choose to rush into your presence today, tomorrow, this whole week, Lord. Regardless of how life circumstances or financial stresses, whether any of that is pulled away or dramatically changed, we believe in the authority of your word that you, when we are in your presence, renew our minds and transform our lives. May we come near to Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Would you stand? If you want to pray with somebody, man, I'd love to. We got elders here. You can raise your hand. They'll come pray with you. Some of you are just like, man, I just like to do that with somebody. But take this moment just to worship the Lord. Not in ritual. We don't want him to test what we're going to finish out with. Man, take some time to draw near to the Lord before you leave today.